Let's praise God with some hymns. Let's pray, uh, sing with all our heart. Let's, uh, let's uh, look for 432 on the hymn, hymn 432. This is the word of God. Since we're not, we're, we've changed our closing song, and we're not singing 214, but I love the words to this song. We have this hope that burns within our hearts. Hope in the coming of the Lord. We have this faith that Christ alone imparts. Faith in the promise of his word. We believe the time is here when the nations far and near shall awake and shout, Hallelujah, Christ is King. We have this hope that burns within our hearts, hope in the coming of the Lord. Amen. We are united in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are united in His love, love for the waiting people of the world, people who need our Savior's love. Soon the heavens will open wide. Christ will come to claim his bride. All the universe will sing, Hallelujah, Christ is King. We have this hope, this faith, and God's great love. We are united in Christ. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for each one who's come today. Dear Father, we have this hope in the coming of the Lord. Help us, dear Father, to cling to this hope and that we may prepare others for the second coming of the Lord. In thy name, amen. amen. Our study today is going to be based on Matthew 24, basically. So if you want to turn your Bibles there. Um, How soon will Jesus return? You know, uh, Jesus and his disciples were, walk, were walking out of the temple in Jerusalem when the disciples commented on how beautiful the temple was. They were shocked to hear Jesus say that the temple was going to be demolished. The city would be destroyed and all the people would be scattered. Matthew 24, 2. Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Jesus' prediction came true in AD 70 when the Roman army surrounded Jerusalem and captured it after a terrible five-month siege. The temple was burned to the ground, contrary to Titus's orders. Flavius Josephus, in his book, The Jewish War, he described how the Roman soldiers carrying torches went into the temple and caused the dry wood of the building to light up just as if it were kindling. Josephus wrote, The city and the temple were then leveled to the ground. 
by the command of Caesar. Only the highest towers and part of that western wall remained to show all mankind how the Romans had overpowered such strong fortress. The disciples troubled Jesus. Jesus they were troubled by Jesus' words. And they came to privately and asked, Matthew 24, verse 3, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of this age? This question has gripped Christians down through the ages. When will we, Jesus return to this earth? It seems like we've waited so long. But Jesus doesn't want us to lack hope as we wait for his coming. He answered the disciples' questions, and in doing so, he answered some of our questions as well. In Matthew 24 and Luke 21, Jesus gave several signs, or evidences, by which we can know that his coming is near. Other Bible prophecies can help fill in this picture detailing world conditions just before Jesus' return. Let's look at the signs that Jesus gave us to show that his coming is near. Sign number one, there will be signs in the religious world. Matthew 24, verses 5, 4 and 5 say, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Jesus was telling the disciples that false prophets would arise and that they would tell the Jewish people that their city and temple, it was not going to be destroyed, as he had predicted. This warning was also given to those of us living in the last days of our history. False, deceptive teachings abound today. Many claim to speak for Jesus, but we can't always trust everything that they say. This is why we need to study God's Word. Be in His Word daily. Daily we need to be in His Word. We need to study for ourselves and understand the truths that are in God's Word as found in the Bible. Amen. In fact, Jesus warns us that we need to be doubly aware of deception down here at the end of earth's history. Matthew 24, verses 23 through 26 warns us, Then if anyone says to you, Look, here's the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive. What's going to happen? Great signs and great wonders. Miracles will be wrought in the name of Jesus. But they're deceptive. See, I've told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert. Do not go out to look. Or look, he's in the inner rooms. Do not believe. Jesus explains very clearly that false teachers of the scriptures will change his words and perform, perform miracles. Miracles to prove that they are representatives of Christ. Some will even say, Jesus is come and he's speaking and he's performing miracles in this town or that retreat over there outside of the city. When this happens, Jesus says that you should not listen to them. It is not me, he warns, because when I return to the earth, everyone is going to know it. In fact, my return to the earth will be like lightning flashing across the sky. Have you ever tried to close your eyes and you still see the lightning flashing across the skies? Everyone is going to see it. Matthew 24, 27. Over the years, numerous false prophets have arisen. In the 60s, there may be some of you still who remember Charles Manson. He told his little small group of followers that he was Christ. Jim Jones, some of you will remember Jim Jones, and Georgetown Guyana. 
he convinced his followers that he was speaking for Jesus and that they should all drink this cyanide lace flavored drink. Hundreds died as shown in graphic newspaper and television photos. There was also David Koresh. He and many of his followers tragically lost their lives in the destruction of their compound there in Waco, Texas. In recent years, we've seen the founder and leader of the Philippines-based Kingdom of Jesus Christ, the name above every name incorporated, and Alan Jones, A.J. Miller, leader of the Divine Truth Movement, headquarters there in Australia. Both claim to be the appointed Son of God. Apollo has an estimated six million followers worldwide. Miller is a former computer systems engineer who says that he is Jesus of Nazareth. We've talked about Jesus of Nazareth. He's Jesus of Nazareth through incarnation, he says. However, according to Jesus and the scriptures, when Jesus returns to his earth, he will come in the clouds of heaven. How many will see him? Every eye will see him. Revelation 1-7. In addition to individuals pretending to be Jesus, false teachings can appear in others other ways. Superstition, spiritualism, and their cult continue to flourish, although they may have long predicted that reason and the scientific method would make belief in these things unbelievable, if not obsolete. But in the 21st century, people still cling to their horoscopes and their tarot cards. Some people don't get up and get out of the house until they read their horoscope every day. Educated, scientific, progressive human beings are as superstitious as ever. Spiritualism hasn't shriveled away. It's advertising in broad daylight now. Paganism is simply an alternative lifestyle. Witches and warlocks, they appear on all of our talk shows on TV. New Age practice, practitioners and others, they're everywhere, selling magical crystals and channeling departed loved ones. Counterfeit signs and wonders are becoming and booming. All this makes it even more clear that history is moving toward its climax. Just as Jesus predicted, we are living in the time of the coming of the Son of Man. That's right. Matthew 24, 27. How? How can we identify truth amid such confusion? And God answers that question in these words. Isaiah 8, 20 tells us, to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Sign number two, peace plans and war preparations. Jesus said of the last days, just before his coming, Matthew 24, verses 6 and 7, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Before the 20th century, we had never been waged on a truly worldwide scale. But in that century, nearly every significant nation on earth joined in two great global conflicts. A study conducted by Cornell University in the early 2000s titled Deaths from Wars and Conflicts in the 20th Century estimates that 231 million people died in these conflicts. It's a number so big, it's even hard for me to comprehend that number. Since World War II, we've lived with the knowledge that one push of a button could turn our world into a heap of radioactive rubble. 
No wonder the Bible speaks of God destroying those who destroy the earth. Revelation 11, 18. We're living in a strange world. Everyone agrees that we should give peace a chance, yet we keep engaging in armed conflicts. Old hostilities flare into open conflict. Terrorism has placed the world on what appear, appears to be a permanent war footing. The prophets Micah and Joel predicted at the very time the nations are talking about their desire for peace, Micah 4, verses 1 through 3. Distrust for their neighbors compels them to prepare for war. Joel 3, verses 9 through 13. Long ago, the Bible pictured this current state of perpetual warfare and declared that permanent peace is going to reign on earth only after Jesus returns. Sign number 3, world calamities. How do natural disasters fit into these last day events? Luke 21, 11 and verse 31 says, There will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines and pestilence, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. When you see all these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is very near. Skeptics say, what? There have always been famines and there's always been earthquakes. That's true. But is the situation getting better or is it getting worse? Is the physical earth becoming more livable or is it wearing out? Isn't it amazing to think that a world that has invented self-driving cars, rockets, space stations, and the internet still can't feed all of its people. Why do we still keep seeing these images of starving children with distended stomachs? So when so many countries grow more food than they can consume, but still we have these starving masses. Jesus knows that famines would persist and that selfish human nature Corrupt governments and armed conflicts would grow worse toward the end of time. These factors are what made recent famines so devastating. What about the earthquakes? Data from World Almanac illustrates a stocking increase in earthquakes since the 18th century. It's clear that earthquakes are claiming more and more lives as earthquake zones become more densely populated. According to the U.S. Geographical Survey, hundreds of thousands of people have died in earthquakes around the world just since the year 2000. Just as Jesus predicted, earthquake activity is becoming more problematic as we get closer to his return. You know, just in this area, we're on the New Madrid Fault, and we've been having all kinds of little earthquakes. I don't know if you've noticed or heard in the news, but small earthquakes. Um, so be prepared. Sign number four. We have economic and civil unrest. The Bible, the Bible predicts that the days just before Jesus' return will be marked by economic unrest and unbridled greed. 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 and 2. In the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of money. The Bible does not condemn wealth. In fact, God's blessings include material well-being as well as spiritual blessings. But the Bible does point out the dangers associated with wealth. In Matthew 19, 23, money can easily turn our hearts from God. That's why the Bible says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. That's 1 Timothy 6, 10. That's why Jesus urges us 
Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Where should we put our treasures? In heaven. Matthew 6, 19 and 20. As long as money is gained honestly and used properly, wealth can be a great force for good. The problem arises when a person becomes greedy or relies on his own riches rather than on God. Or a person exploits others <clears throat> in order to increase his own wealth. That's what the Bible says will happen in the last days before Jesus comes. James 5, verses 1 through 3 tells us, Come now, you rich people, weep and howl, for your mis miseries are coming upon you. You have heaped up treasures in the last days. Around the world today, we see economic unrest. As a few people amass, huge amounts of wealth while everyone else is struggling just to stay afloat financially. This economic turmoil often leads to civil unrest and rising tensions between the haves and the have-nots. All this, the Bible tells us, is another sign of the coming of the Lord is at hand. James 5.8 Almost 2,000 years ago, Jesus gave a prophetic description of contemporary life that sounds as if it could have been taken from the evening news. Luke 21, verses 25 through 28 tells us, There will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. On the earth, the stress of nations with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads because your redemption draweth nigh. No more accurate description of today's world could be penned than men's hearts failing them from fear of the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. A generation exists today that has grown up entirely in the shadow of stockpiled weapons capable of destroying the entire planet. Today's apprehensions make yesterday's seem pretty small. What if some terrorist acquires a nuclear warhead? Thankfully, Jesus gives us a basis for hope. Amen. The current crisis of global insecurity, distress, and perplexity often reinforces the truth that Christ's coming is very near. People today often mourn in frustration. Look what our world is coming to. However, the student of Bible prophecy can explain with a hopeful voice, look who is coming to our world. What specific signs did Jesus say would take place to usher in the last days before his coming? Matthew 24, 29 tells us, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Revelation describes these events like this. In Revelation 6, verses 12 and 13, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as that block of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. These predictions were fulfilled in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Just when there was a renewed focus among Bible students around the world on the prophecies regarding the second coming of Jesus, one of the most 
deadly earthquakes every recorded occurred on November 1st, 1755 in Lisbon, Portugal. It destroyed 85% of the buildings in Lisbon and it killed as much as 20% of the city's population. Shock waves from the earthquake were felt all throughout Europe. On May 19th and 1780, an unprecedented darkening of the daytime sky was observed over the northeastern United States and portions of Canada. The darkness was so complete that people had to light candles at noon and chickens went to their roosts to sleep. That night, when the moon arose, contemporary accounts recorded it thus. The moon appeared as blood. A few decades later, on November the 13th, 1833, the stars of heaven fell in one of the largest and most impressive meteor showers ever known. For a period of over nine hours, more than 100,000 mediators fell per hour. These events are part of Bible prophecy, indicating that the world has moved into a time of the end. The period of our history will usher in Jesus' soon return. Sign number six, moral decay. What does the moral fiber of society it seems to be unraveling. 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5 and verse 13 tell us, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Could anyone think of a more accurate description of our world? These stories and images that fill our social media, they make this verse come to life on a daily basis. We see photos of people who have made careers out of arrogant materialism, stories of heartbreaking child abuse, live streams of the horrific results of terror attacks and videos of people who try to make self-indulgent and deviant behavior appear healthy and normal. Our obsession with uninhibited freedom has indeed brought perilous times in these last days. All these things form a gallery of pictures loudly proclaiming that Jesus is coming is very near. Sign number seven, the gospel to all the world. Jesus predicted that just before his coming, the gospel would reach the whole world. Matthew 24, 14 tells us, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. You know, it it was hard to believe several years ago how this could happen. Well, with the media and all the satellites and, and different forms of media now, we can very easily see how this gospel will go into all the world. We've had great Christian missionary movements throughout history, but the spread of the gospel in recent times is unprecedented. Does that have, that doors have been closed to the gospel now are opening around the world. The gospel message is flourishing as never before. Even countries that are closed, somehow the message is getting through these doors, these windows that are opening up for God's message. Even in areas of the world such as Asia, where historically the Christian faith has but a limited impact, it is now possible. 
using current technology to share Christian message with almost every person in every nation on earth. We are living in the very day that Jesus spoke of when he declared, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, and then the end will come. How soon will it be that Jesus will come? Our generation, our generation has witnessed and is witnessing these great signposts of prophecy fulfilled even before our very eyes. Actually describing events that were to characterize the time just preceding his second coming, Jesus concluded his remarks by saying, Matthew 24, 34, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. The conclusion is obvious. The signposts of prophecy directly point to Jesus' return to earth the second time. It won't be long until Jesus will come to sweep away sin and suffering and establish his everlasting kingdom. What did Jesus say about the exact time of his coming? Matthew 24, 36 tells us, Of that day and hour knows no one, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. What important caution has Christ given to us? Matthew 24, 44 tells us, Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect it. Jesus, is the world's only hope. People today, leaders in all areas of society and government, are aware that our world is heading toward a crisis. Some are desperately looking for a way to prevent it. But all technological advances, economic theories, and international organizations are overwhelmed by the global problems. Voices of reason, Goodwill are drowned out by the fierce shouts of ethnic rivalry, political factions. Above all this clamor, however, Jesus declares, I am the way, John 14, 6. He promises, I will come again, John 14, 3. Christ is the last, best hope for our world, because only he can deal with they're everything, the very thing that's destroying our world, and that is sin. Jesus died on Calvary to defeat sin and deliver everyone who responds to his offer of salvation. 1 John 3, 8. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus sacrificed himself. Our Savior made a way of escape from this crumbling world. Someday soon, he's going to cure all of the world's ills and destroy sin. And he offers us right now to erase the guilt of sin from your life. You don't have to wait for the second coming to find release from that guilt that anxiety, and that destructive behavior. Jesus is willing to give you his peace right now at this very moment. Amen. Jesus graciously offers you salvation, complete pardon for your sins, and peace of mind. He is the answer to any problem that you're facing in your life. And he is coming back to this earth again. Soon to take you home with oh dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the promise of your second coming, the day that you will come and to take us home with you. Dear Father, help each one of us to purpose in our heart to be ready for that day, to be ever ready for your second coming because no man knows the day nor the hour. Help us, dear Father, to prepare our hearts to be ready for your second coming. Dear Father, help us to make wrongs right and to come to the point where we would rather die than to sin. 
Help us, dear Father, to long for that day, to share with others the, the blessed hope of your soon return. In thy name, amen. 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 amen.